without getting personal, MSK. MSK as a crew, um, amazing, because I don't know another crew that has as many hardcore graffiti artists that have been made the successful transfer to gallery artists and kept it separate than their graffiti. Mm. Because if you look at all of us from Revoke to Retina to Rhyme to myself to Pose to Ewok to all these people Mm. that have this incredible gallery style body of work and the graffiti being totally separate. We're not doing our graffiti on canvas yeah. in the galleries. And I, I, I'm very proud of that. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Look all professional over here. Got pro in this piece, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast. Live and direct. I ain't gonna tell you where yet because it's a surprise. Big shout out to all the regulars. You know what it is. The podcast for music and street culture from all forms of rocking. And if you know all about that, then you know about the Television app. Free download for iPhone and Android for all street culture sports. For mini docs, podcasts, full docs, mini mixes and more. You know what time it is. Big shout out to all affiliates as well. We ain't in London right now, baby. Camera on. We are definitely in a new location in Los Angeles. Well, actually California. We're just outside. In an undisclosed location. And I tell you once, I'll tell you one or more times, this place is one hell of a treasure trove of activity. It's a hub of all sorts going on. And the proprietor is one of the original dons from Los Angeles, California. One of the original graph writers from the beginning, early stages. He's got a list, a list of firsts from freights to I'm just going to run it off, man. <laughs> it's going to go on forever. The Don MSK Risk Inside. The up, Blaze. <laughs> How Damn, are you, that was Jim? impressive. Did you like that? Yeah. yeah I, mean, I, mean, I mean, here's the thing. It's, it's a lot more easier to yeah. articulate this sort of thing when you actually are dealing with the, the GOAT, the real deal. Now, come on, you know? Yeah, we do a little podcast, but I'm like, I just stumble through. I'm like, uh... Do you? Do you podcast as well, yeah? It's not a podcast. We do a live stream on Thursdays. Oh. Uh, and we did it during COVID because we couldn't get out. So we had our friends come over and we have a chef and a, and a bartender. We just have a little party. Uh, but you seem very natural. You, you have it down. Ours is a little rough. Yeah, but I think, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you. I mean, to, 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 to get that from you is, is gold. It's more, um, I, I think the, the, the idea of communicating, conveying, particularly for people that are super passionate about the same yeah. things as you are. Uh, yeah, it can be a little. It can be a bit rudimental, can't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's so important though, right? Because mm. like uh, you know, dialogue. People say, "Why are you an artist?" I'm like, "That's how I speak." You know, it's yeah. dialogue. That's you know, and, yeah. and like-minded individuals, and you know, yeah, yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah. And there's an audience for everything as well. I'm sure within the. And I want to start with actually stepping up front rather than going too yeah. far back in the day just yet because. I, I can't emphasize to you guys enough, and I'll make sure I get some camera footage of what's going on around here. Um, it's almost like a park you, you've created over the 16 years you've been here, a park environment, almost like a village mentality of creative output. To, to the, to, in front of us there is like a yard that has got, you know, whips, and you're building not, uh, car whips, guys, if you're from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> We're not trying to go into any of this and stuff. But, um, you know, more... Um, uh, vehicle-esque, recycling, um, spray paint and uh, spray cans and you've got like people that are working in the engine rooms there and then you've got um, a, you know an exhibition place of your own. This whole area here is like nothing but paint and creating output. You've got a 24-hour uh, a machine happening here. Yeah, yeah, we do, man. Uh, it's It just happened. You know, we built this place and... Uh, we kind of kept growing and growing and pushing and pushing, and then I bought the house next door and knocked the wall down, and mm-hmm. and uh, it just keeps going, you know. But it's good; it's a good time. We have a lot of good people in here, a lot of good energy, and you know, we consider this place uh, a work of art in its own. Like it's a piece, so a work, you know. And part of it is everyone that comes through here and leaves their little piece, whether the aura or mantra, whatever it is, they mm. leave something here with it. So it's pretty cool, man. Every little nook and cranny, you'll see little carvings of people here. This, you know, whatever. Mm. It's cool. It's true. Uh, aura, energy, 
uh, the people and the contributors. Contributors, to, in, a, in a smaller uh, example being here, that, that you're, the contributors are what creates the environment, the energy, and uh, ultimately me walking in completely blind to this. You know, yeah. it doesn't look like this on the front, yeah. but you walk in, it's like, yo, this feels like I've been here before. It feels like, oh, yo, this is, this is bustling. Yeah, you know what's cool? Uh, Forbes, Forbes 500 came and they did an article on the compound, right? Stop it. Yeah, and it was cool because they were like, they compared it to Warhol's uh, Fun Factory, you know, and because <sighs> the people that we had coming through and, and happened, just so happens on that day that they came, it was a fucking great day. Mm. We had, I think, Dave Navarro was here. A bunch of people were here creating stuff and it was just, it was fucking mind-boggling. And I was just like, wow, it really is kind of really, you know, it, mm. that's the first time it hit me what was happening here, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, because I'm, you know, I, I live here and everyone else works here and hangs out here. And, you know, I'll wake up at three, four in the morning, can't sleep. And I'll look outside and see what's going on. I'm like, oh, who's in the print shop? And I go mm. check it out. Or who's over there? And I go check it out, you know? So you're constantly refueled with inspiration based on environmental changes and people being here and... Yeah. It must be like a conveyor, but I mean, you said Dave Navarro there. I mean, yeah. And also having, um, I guess, somebody from the outside like Forbes who are completely removed. Blew me away, man. Because, yeah. like, you know, we got three articles in Forbes last year, which to me was like, I was like, whoa, dream. you know, yeah. it, was, it was a dream. It was great. You know, I sold something at a, a record auction, you know, so I got the, the article I would expect to be in Forbes, right? Mm. Money thing. But them just to come do the compound was like, whoa, yeah. that was cool. Because that has nothing to do with money. That, that was just in like, itself is a... That was just yeah. a cool article, right? So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, big time. Big time. Do, do, you, uh, do you get calls in for... I mean, right, so as we were walking through past the pool and, you know, the, the Rolling Stones neon sign, there was a, a whole stack of uh, music equipment and rehearsal space. Do you get bands and people coming through here as well? Oh, yeah, tons, man. We, you know, we have... We've had... I mean, I don't want to not drop names, but everyone so I'll from... I'll pick them up for you. You can <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. You know, we, everyone from, you know, people from Jane's Addiction, Chili Peppers, Guns N' Roses, I mean, Billy Idol, everyone you can imagine, people from those bands or those people have been here and played for just, you know, 30 people, maybe 100 people. I am not a, I'm cool. not worthy, dude. I swear to God, like, you've had Guns N' Roses and on that. Where do they play? Do they play in the park there? The parking lot there? Well, we've had people play... Oh, like Rocky just took a plant. We've had people play in the studio. We've had people, we've set up a stage over there. We've and then we have the gallery. People playing there. It's a permanent kind of little setup thing. Uh, Mickey Avalon just did his record in there. Yeah, that's so that the was really cool. Latest, yeah, um, we've had uh, Rome, a good friend of mine, Rome, who lives in the neighborhood. He um, he's a Grammy award winning producer. Uh, he's working with Flavor Flav and a bunch of people, and he comes Sick. through here and he's gonna pretty much adopt the place as his personal studio. Wow. Um, so we have, we're very blessed here. Is that an important factor for you, to the, the, the door being open and this, this, this environment constantly being um, utilised, even if it's not a monetary gain or anything, it's just knowing that these people uh, are entrusting this space and you and the people around to, to be able to facilitate that thing. Is that what it's more about? Yeah, it's a fine line, you know, because we're family and it's, 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 we're, we're, we're pretty tight-knit. Uh, it's hard to get in here, you know. It's like anything else, especially mm. with hip hop. You understand you got to pay your dues, and people that pay their dues is definitely open to them. Mm. Uh, it's a little hard for some of the new people to get in here. Yeah. Uh, but you know we're we're welcome to everyone, and we love everyone, mm. and and we have a lot of new guys that come there that are fucking amazing and mm. blowing us away, and we love those guys. Um, but yeah, it's just a, it's a it's a place for like minded individuals. So it doesn't matter if you're new or old or whatever. It's just. People that understand, people that get it, get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that's it. And that it really, I mean, for me personally, it's an energy thing. Uh, at this point, I want to big up Dust uh, UA 100% for, yeah. for connecting the dots, man. Because, you know, uh, like you say, uh, there is an element of paying dues when you come into an environment like yeah. this. And you've got an, you, you can't just be coming into the business. You know what I mean? You've got to know someone that knows someone. And kinda, you yeah, know, Duster, wings, you know, like you know? when Duster calls and says, do this podcast, you know, you do the podcast, you know? <laughs> you know? Ah, that's right. Hold tight. Um, paying dues is a re has been and will continue to be a, a real supporting factor in the uh, legitimacy yeah. of, uh, of, of the hip hop culture and more so, so the street creative culture. Um, and you, more than anybody, I would say, has, has not only delivered on that, more so probably as a promise to yourself <laughs> as yeah. much as the rest of the scene but you've also um, you, you've gained you know fruitfulness in, in doing this how did you get to that point where the decision was made or was it more of an organic journey that you took to get to this place right now 
You know, it's funny you say that because I was with um, a friend of mine last night. He was an IT guy, and he was uh, making a joke. He's like, congratulations on your overnight success. And we were laughing because <laughs> that's what people always say, and they don't realize what, you ha- what you've done. Like, and this place is amazing. I love it. But people don't realize I lost three houses mm-hmm. uh, and properties and foreclosures and stuff like that, building. Um, so it, ne- it never comes easy, you know. But, um, mm. you know, over the years – it's finally there. I've, I've managed to scrape and hold on to things and, and very, a lot of collectibles and put them all in one place and build this place. And you learn also as you go, you know, so I did, mm. it, I did it right this time. <laughs> you did you know? blindness. But yeah, I guess it's all about repetition mistakes and, and are there any really ever any mistakes? There, yeah. there aren't really, are there? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's mistakes, you know, like, you know, I, well, obvious I, ones. I've, you know, I've, I go full steam ahead. You know, I, I lived beyond my means for years, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. Um, but I just, I have that vision, and I, you know, I believe build and they will come. You know, that mm. that whole thing to me is is is, is key and king, and um, I do that. And you know, we've we've had the good team around here, and we've been blessed to make it happen. So we're on another journey yet. You don't even know about yet, but we just can we talk about that. We better talk, we we talk about it. It's <laughs> happening. The thumbs up over in the corner. <laughs> we we um we just closed on a building two minutes away. So another building on the on the boulevard out here in, in Thousand Oaks, and it's a very it's a really dope building. But we bought a building that we're gonna make a permanent gallery, um, a private gallery, appointment only kind of thing, and it's gonna be really next level. It's gonna be like our personal museum gallery thing. And we're going to have some of the best cars in there, some of the best music equipment in there, some of the best art. We're, we're taking the best of the best of everything and making our own little showcase. You that know? is fantastic, yeah. man. See, if you've got any reason to come to Thousand Oaks, and trust me, this is like one, one-stop shop. One-stop yeah. shop. You know, I never uh, ex- <laughs> expected to be out here, and I just, I, I mean, I love it. You know, you got, it's pretty popular these days with Calabasas and, you know, everything that goes mm-hmm. on. And uh, so many people live out here now, but... Um, it was the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, we got out of L.A. We had, I think our last, we had two studios in there. One was 10,000 square feet, one was 5,000 square feet, and they were great studios, amazing studios. And we put so much time and love into those studios, but we didn't own them, you know. Mm. And answering to people is hard, you know, when we want to knock out a wall or build a mezzanine or yeah. have a party or something like that, you know, and you have to jump through hoops. We're like, fuck it. Yeah, yeah. So we came out here and did our own thing, and it worked out. Um, with, uh, with that in mind, did you ever... F- like you said, there, 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 are, there, there are a number of stumbling blocks that come over the course of yeah. years. And I'm sure over the 16 years in building this, you must have had a vision. You must have known when the temperature was at its peak and you're like, this is exactly how I envisaged it. Well, you know, uh, the city of Thousand Oaks has been uh, incredible to me because when I came out here, I built everything without permits. Uh, I built everything when the economy collapsed and not a necessity. I was losing warehouses and this and that. And I just built and, and I, I had to battle the city for years. And I finally was able to bring things up to, to their code and they signed off on stuff. And even some of these structures that weren't to code back then, they're working with me to get them to code now. And then I bought the house in the meantime next door, built all that to code. Mm-hmm. And now I have a really great relationship with the city. I've done the museum here, and I'm so do some other stuff, and I own multiple properties in the city, and it's working wow. out. But um, you know, I, I came out here, and I wasn't so uh, welcomed when I first came out here. I, there know, goes the neighborhood, <laughs> the, basically. It. But um, <laughs> the, the neighborhood's been awesome. My mm. neighbors love me, and I love my neighbors. We're very blessed with that. Mm. Um, but it was a transition, and you know, you have to learn to play by the rules. And yeah, we did. But did you ever think you would end up having to, you know, talk to the council or the, you know, certain property developers and stuff, and try and get the leverage on pa- passing certain things? You through? know what's crazy, man? Like, uh, I'm no stranger to dealing with city officials my whole life, and mm-hmm. in a negative light because I was a vandal. Yeah. Um, it's it's their job to hate me. I get it. It's no big deal. Yeah. But I've never experienced people that don't know me and just look at me, treat me like that. I was like, oh wow, this is like some kind of racism shit that I'm not used to. I'm always used to it because they know who I am, what I did, mm. and I'm paying the price for it. But them just looking at me and saying this long hair dude with tattoos, this and that, I'm like, wow, that was a different kind of feeling, you know. But like, you know, a different kind of fucked upness. Different kind of fucked upness. You know, I I'm, I'm totally used to being like shit on because. All the mm. stuff I did, yeah. I get it. I, yeah. I, I don't. It because I've got, me. I, that's a consequence of something I've done. Let alone I've done but, nothing. But, <laughs> but, but I'm like, oh wow, this guy doesn't even know me. And yeah, yeah. like that. You fucking with me. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, that that's it's very telling, isn't it? But yeah. uh, uh, and, uh, and it's a test of character. That's it's always good when you come at the other side of something like that, right? Yeah, and they're not used to like, um, you know, someone like me that's been dealing with this so many years, mm. and uh, you know, I have a my legal team is top notch right now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. We're ready for anything. Just take it up with his lawyers. Yeah, and get the fuck out of here. Um, well, let's take it back for a piece because there's some guys out there, some guys and girls out there that will most certainly know the notoriety of risk um, from uh, the early doors and adaptations of, as you were saying, the vandalism boogie of yeah. this time. There is a list, and I said this at the top, there is a, a string, a slew of testimonials to your name that, that lean towards the first, you know, the, 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 the Don creator of yeah. the freight culture over yeah. here. The, the, one of the first people to do um, roadside uh, uh, pieces as well as um, uh, uh, yeah. posts and, you know, just signposts and things like that with, that were just at the time un, untouched, unknown. It, yeah. was, it was a new thing. Um, what, was the, what was the thinking of this? Was this just a, a, a re, repackaging from an East Coast point of view? And, 100%, man. Right. Like, I was, like, so influenced by the East Coast in New York, you know, because, you know, I was doing graffiti in 83, and, you know, New York already had, like, 10 years on us, and they were doing this stuff, and I was, like, mimicking what they were doing, and, you mm. know, they were doing these incredible social commentaries on these big steel trains that went through the city, and they could sit in a platform and watch them all go by, and this and that, and I was like... And I wish we had that, you know. So we didn't have that. So I was like, how do I do that? I have to hit the freeways. Mm-hmm. So I had to go out and hit freeways, and I had to put a map out. And, you know, I didn't have layups or whatever, whatever. So I had to go hit all these different freeways to do that. So that's how that happened. And then people were like, well, what made you? Because, you know, they had gang writing on freeways, but they didn't have any kind of pieces or definitely not colored pieces. And then people yeah. said, what made you do that? I was like, looking at whole cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, you know, I have to do bigger, do better, bigger productions, whole cars. So I started doing these big pieces, characters, backgrounds, the whole deal. And that's how that happened. And then, you know, as far as um, freight trains, the same thing, man. I like, I wanted to hit trains and I had no trains. So I went to the Budweiser factory out there in like 83 or something. I think, I think the first, I wrote a bunch of things before Risk, but I think the first Risk piece was in 83 or late 83 or something. And it was um, on a freight train. Mm-hmm. And I had never painted metal before, never hit a freight train before. And um, I remember, like, the the paint, you know, I was trying to do my highlight. Mm-hmm. And it kept dripping, so I kept it the highlight <laughs> off the drip, off the drip. So it looked like a big spider web. You know, it was terrible. <laughs> it was fucking terrible. But, uh, and what kept that going was, honestly, because I was breaking into the, the trains and, and Budweiser was stealing beer. So it's the best place to go paint because you just go fucking... You get some beer as well. Yeah. And that just started this whole little culture. So then, you know, we kind of gave it up. And then years after that, uh, Dream, rest in peace, uh, Charlie, Power, myself, started hitting these trains. And that we had our own little clique. Mm. And that started the whole freight train movement in Los Angeles. Mm. And... um, I think Los Angeles really kicked that off, and then you know, free chain movement went everywhere. You know, uh, it went everywhere, and, and furthermore, it goes everywhere. I feel like with freights, there's so much more distance for yeah. them, isn't there? Like, but especially with a, such a spacious, you know, country as America. But um, even now, I, I, I say this is maybe a bit spicy for some people this time of the morning, but I, I feel like the longevity of a piece on a freight outweighs. Anything on a, on a train or a, on, or well, a tube system? Yeah, especially now. You know, I mean, you know, they, they get, you know, if you go over the numbers, they buff the numbers and stuff like that, you know. But mm. yeah, I, I constantly see, like, a dream piece, man. Someone just sent me a dream piece that I did with Dream, I don't know, 80s, mid 80s or something. <laughs> and it was just like this Rasta colored piece that was just like so not typical for us at the time. But we did this, I don't know why, maybe it's all the paint we had, but mm. it was this Rasta Risk dream piece. And, um, yeah, I just saw it, man. That thing is so old. You could just see the certain colors. You could tell the Rust-Oleum was still there. Oh, And all the sick. other brands that we use are gone completely. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Solid, yeah, Rust-Oleum does not <laughs> yeah. fail. Yeah. <laughs> That's so sick. Um, and so far as uh, tr- uh, roadsides and, well, you know, what was... What, <laughs> there's always a risk factor to me, so don't try this at home, kids. But, uh, yeah motorways in uh, America yeah. you know they're, 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 they're identifiably uh, uh, a lot more uh, intense than most places on earth because yeah. roads are king uh, in the well US, for us right? it was really dangerous because of the gangs you know so you know we were in different neighborhoods and people mm. the gangs don't know what we're doing you know and they know we're not from their neighborhood so they're they trying to 
shoot us. You know, I got shot and, and, and stuff, shot at multiple times. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of problems that came with that in L.A. because of the gangs. Mm. You know, that was the biggest problem. As far as the, the cars, you know, we had people get hit by cars. That was terrible. You know, that happens. Yeah. But we had to really watch out for gangs. That was the, the big thing, you know. Do you think, I, I, I would say from an authority's point of view, you know, there, there's a naivety. Actually, there's a, there's a zero tolerance, isn't it? It's like the moment you see graffiti full stop, everyone, it's, from a West Coast point of view, thinks it's gang. How close was the relationship between graffiti, you know, bona fide hip hop graffiti and the gang graffiti? So, you know, we had, I've, I've, I've ridden that roller coaster for a long time with graffiti in the West Coast because when I first started doing graffiti in the 80s, 83, stuff like that, people never saw anything like it before and they thought it was really cool. Mm. They're like, that shit's cool. What is it? Oh my God, colors, this, that. Mm. And then, you know, breaking came in and Beat Street and all that stuff in the mid 80s, whatever, and it was really popular. And it was still cool. And then the tagging came in, and it got really not cool. Mm, so yeah. I watched the whole uh, society, so to speak, or the government officials or whatever you want to call it, city people, get behind graffiti, condemn graffiti, and then come back around to get behind graffiti again. You know, Art in the Streets came about, and all of a sudden the newspapers said this is a legitimate art form. Mm. <laughs> and all of a sudden people loved it again. I was like, wow. Mm. You know? But I went through a period of time where, you know, Vulcan was out here. He spent a bunch of time out here with me. And I didn't use the word graffiti because I thought it had a negative connotation, right? Mm. So I was like, I'm an artist. I'm not a graffiti artist. And I was like, fuck it, man. I'm a graffiti artist. Take it or left, leave it. You know, mm. it is what it is. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, I, I think I'm at the uh, place in life right now where I'm just an artist, you know, and I happen to love graffiti and do graffiti. And, I, you know, I don't really believe in titles of street art, graffiti art, art whatever. It's just artists. They don't exist anymore. Yeah. I, I'm kind of of the opinion, you know, just even being in L.A., uh, this side of uh, uh, COVID and, and us being able to uh, yeah. travel again. Graffiti... Um, I wouldn't say tolerated, that's the wrong word, but the, the emergence of street art and um, almost like uh, replenishing the areas that ma- matter to uh, the, 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 uh, the, the governing bodies, I think has a di- it's got a different attitude. There's a different attitude this time around. Yeah. In the city. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, you know, I, the city's a city, you know. Yeah. Do you feel like, we, because obviously your Instagram is you, popping at the moment, and uh, you've really adapted, I guess, that sensibility, that um, uh, a, a modern day twist to the street art phenomena that's out there. You've, you're definitely working with a lot more colours. You're working a lot more with space. There's a lot more going on that, yeah. that works in its environment, doesn't it? Yeah. So, you know, my stuff is it's like... It's funny because my graffiti art is different than my gallery art. It's different than my murals and my public art. Right. You know, I'm a color field artist as far as murals, and I like to evoke emotion with color. And that became about for me trying to get the same. Okay, that, going down the freeway at seven miles an hour after you do a piece, mm-hmm. and you get that, you see it, and you get all pumped up. You're like, that shit's dope. Mm. I was trying to get that same feeling without letters or characters, right? So that's mm. how the color washes came about. Ooh. And color field painters evoke emotion with color, so it was a perfect thing for me. And that, mm. that was a new thing for me. I started doing the buildings, the bigger, the better, the, you know, mm. all these things. So that's that art form. My graffiti is my graffiti, it's straight graffiti. And my gallery stuff is mixed media stuff, which has a graffiti palette, but just different kind of things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they're all just different, you know? I don't know. So people always like, I think, you know, if you're an artist, you know, your DNA is going to be on stuff, so you should always have trace elements of all your stuff and all your stuff. Mm. So I think if you look at my palettes, they probably cross over, but if you look at the mediums, they're always different, you yes, know? Yes, for sure. But the color wash thing is definitely, I, I mean, it, to me, it's like a salute to the West Coast, like, you know, Brian Wilson is to the Beach Boys, you know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah, yeah. Like, you know, when you see that color wash that you've got going on there, how, how thought through, and by the way, I might just say, there's some rock and roll music going on as we speak right now, baby, <laughs> like, this is proper shit. How influential is that? Is the um, uh, environment of the West Coast and what the, you, you, what the music captures? And, you know, because when I see that color wash, it's like it feels very much in its place. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, it's, it's super important. Like, I, I was in London painting for Olympics oh, with Ron English, beautiful. Shepard, uh, Tristan Eaton. Nice. Sabre mm-hmm. and myself. These are old dons inside, you know, casual. And we're at uh, something gardens. I don't know. We're, we're, we're painting these murals. Mm-hmm. And I got there, and um, anyway, so long story short, I got there, and I was like, what are you going to do, Risk? I said, I don't want to write Risk. And I looked at him, and they're like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, man, what's up? 
and Ron English was the one like, you know, it's like, well, you know, you're here painting for the Olympics. You should, you know, try to have something to say. I'm like, I don't have anything to say. I'm not a political artist. I'm not this. I'm mm. not that. I'm not a culture jammer. I just want to mm. do these big... Did you feel challenged at that point? Was it, was it a yeah, challenging Yeah, I was really pissed off. Really? Yeah. So I went up to my room and I said, like, man, fuck that dude. And I started thinking about it. And I was like, well, you know what? Maybe he's right. You know, I'm getting paid to be out here and do this. You know, maybe I need to think about what makes me tick. You know, mm. what am I most happy about? And that's when I came up with, I'm the most happy looking at a piece going down the freeway the next day after what I did. And then it hit me, man, 90% of the people can't read that piece. And 90% of the and people it's like... it's just a wash. They just, they just whoosh. So I was like, that's what I want to do, man. I want to get that feeling without it being graffiti, without it being letters or whatever. So I came back the next day feeling all kind of smart and shit and told Ron, I go, Yo, man, I'm just trying to fuck your vocal motion with color and this and that. And he goes, yeah, exactly, man. You're a color field artist. Goes, that's where I wanted you to get to. That's what I wanted you to realize. Oh and my thank God, you, Ron English. Good. I was like, duh. Like, he, yeah, just, yeah. he just hit me with a ton of bricks. Yeah. And it was right there. And he was like the ultimate teacher to me that led me to the water. You know, it's mm. like, you know, you got to drink it, but I'm going to lead you there. How often do you get those moments where people actually say what they think and they give you actually some pearls of, of like, yeah, you know what? I've had a couple. Ron English was definitely one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dennis Hopper was another one. Okay. So Dennis was uh, a friend of mine, and he actually judged the first graffiti contest in Los Angeles in like 85 or something like that. And he, we became friends throughout the whole process. Beautiful. And I used to show him pictures of graffiti and whatnot. And once I showed him some pictures, I was like, look, Dennis, Looks like a fucking sign painter did it. My can control's on point. Like, crisp, looks like tape, not a drip. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, yeah, man, you should just be a sign painter. I'm like, well, fuck you, I'm an artist. And he goes, eh. Oh, he, God. He goes, uh, you should get tight and paint loose. And I'm like, what? And he goes, you get tight and paint loose, man. He goes, you, he, Dennis considered himself a graffiti artist. He goes, um, you know why we use spray paint is because you want to see the hand. You want to see it done with spray paint. You want to see those drips. You want to see that overspray. And I was like, what are you talking about? I started thinking about it. I was like, fuck, all the shit that I like, Futura and uh, uh, Toxic, and all these dudes that I was like looking at at the time that I loved, Dondi with that drippy, mm-hmm. splattery stuff and all that shit like, that was just so fucking powerful. I was mm-hmm. like, wow, mm-hmm. that's right. So from that point on, I stopped cleaning up my drips on my piece and anything. If there's a drip, there's a drip. Like, I just kind of let it go. And that transferred to my gallery work, which you don't have anything here to show you. But... That whole get tight and paint loose thing was another thing that hit me like a ton of bricks. And that was from Dennis Hopper. So Ron English, Dennis Hopper. There's been a couple people in my life that really told me some shit that I was like... Yeah. But these are, this is gold dust for anybody listening. The, the, yeah. The, 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 the levels of... The levels uh, of somebody, of an established artist that can also often be challenged themselves and, and accept the challenge... You rose to the occasion of the challenge. Yeah, you have to, man. You know, like, you know, we come from the streets of battling, right? So that was like part of our culture back then. Battles were a big thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you always have to, like, you know, and, and, and you, if you can't take criticism being a street artist or a graffiti artist, you're fucked. You, you know? ain't growing. You, know? <laughs> you, ain't going, you ain't going nowhere. Um, let's talk MSK and uh, this, this era. I mean, I, I, I was going to ask you the other day, big up ask you, and I swear to God, like, there's a lot of people in MSK. Well, it's not a lot of people, but there's a lot of fucking heavy hitters. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we have, I don't know, 30 something people maybe. I don't know what the, the total is. Uh, Revoke just had his show in Detroit at the museum and everyone, I, my, I was going to bring my daughters and they got cool. We couldn't make it down, but I got to watch that from afar and watch everyone that showed up and how we're like a family and how blessed I was to be part of that family. Mm. But that, without getting personal, MSK, MSK is a crew um, amazing because I don't know another crew that has as many hardcore graffiti artists that have been made the successful transfer to gallery artists and kept it separate than their graffiti. Because mm. if you look at all of us from Revoke to Retina to Rhyme to myself to Pose to Ewok to all these people mm. that have this incredible gallery style body of work yeah. and the graffiti being totally separate we're not doing our graffiti on canvas yeah. in the galleries and I, I, I'm very proud of that I think yeah, that's yeah. very cool you know yeah and just going back to what you were saying about having these different um, head spaces for like you say the gallery stuff the outdoor stuff the, the street stuff yeah you, 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 that embodies MSK I think that also yeah. translates right with MSK doesn't it MSK is like you know we, we still uh, everyone gets down everyone's still you know, I'm not going to tell you where we do it, but everyone's still... Mind your own business, none of your business out there, right? <laughs> you know, 
a lot of people in MSK have have uh, rap sheets, and, and the city officials are on them hardcore. So we have to paint where we can paint when we can paint. So it's mm-hmm. a little different for us. We're not allowed to just go bomb and post it like a lot of people can. We yeah. can't do that these days. But everyone's still, you know, if you if you're on social media, you see everyone's getting busy. Yeah, yeah, getting busy, busy, bumble on belief. Um, uh, and on that note, in terms of busyness and uh, Hall of Fames and LA, the in play, the, the places where the, the graph can be seen. It's it's so widespread, isn't it? Well, you know, COVID came, yeah, and all the all the fucking walls went down. You know? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Everyone just started bombing again. Yeah, um, you know, but you know, just just areas of, you know, of course, there's the the um, the legendary uh, kind of uh, sewer yeah. areas and and whatnot. You know, the the, the classic kind of uh, places that we all know and love uh, yeah. that LA is known for. But uh, you know, there there isn't there isn't one centralized. Hall of Fame is there there's not like no we had mm-hmm. Belmont Tunnel we, we had okay it started out with uh, West Coast Tracks was the first yard and then Venice mm-hmm. and then the Motor Yard Motor Yard and Venice kind of the same time mm-hmm. Belmont was always there Belmont was uh, really lasted the, the test of time that was the last major uh, Hall of Fame yard that we had they, there's an apartment building there now and that's on the east side and mm-hmm. that's where K2S and LA Bomb Squad and and uh all those guys came from and um that was an incredible place for us but we lost those places yeah and then you know as far as yards now i'm sure there's thousands that i don't even know about mm. but you know as far as the, the glory days and the big yards i don't think we really have anymore really you know no, I, i'm always troubled particularly with la and new york and the more you know top top tier cities of the u.s how easily disposable history is for the for the, for the builders and uh, well also you know you have the downtown the art district kind of mm. you know we always had an art district people didn't know about it i was there for years mm-hmm. i used to walk around with a gun in my waistband and never see a cop all day and never see maybe see three people mm. i used to shoot guns off the back porch cartoon and i were roommates and uh Stevon and and lucky and and, and uh all these people Polly b we used to come to my studio and shoot shotguns and all kind of shit that if you ever did that now you'd fucking be in jail mm. in two seconds you know yeah. And uh, it's just different now. It's all, I was downtown the other day, and it's just fucking crazy. I'm looking at it like I was showing um, my kids. I'm like, that was my studio. It's gone. It's a fucking bridge now. It's just, you know, it's, yeah. it's crazy. But um, How does that make you feel? How, like, literally, like, so much stuff just Well, disappears. I guess what I was, I was going with that was that, so all the yards kind of disappeared, but you have this big mega of uh, art district downtown. So everyone's getting up legally on big walls, and so they're doing their own masterpieces and, and taking their little chunk of, of history or society or whatever and, and preserving it through this. So it's just kind of transformed. It's, mm. it's there, but it's just spread out more. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cool. I mean, you know, it's like, if you look at Wynwood in mm-hmm, Miami, mm-hmm. it's fucking shit everywhere. That's like one big yard, right? Yeah, and there's, big time. And there's cities like that, I guess, around the world. You know, I don't think we have that quite yet. You know, LA is too hardcore on the mural ordinances and stuff like that. But yeah, do you think the gang uh, uh, relativity to, to to bombing and piecing and territorial like you know symbols and stuff? Do you think that plays a part in the reason why maybe like st- street art as is embraces it is in other cities perhaps isn't so much here? No, I think that's a wide question. Is that is that why? No, I think that, that it's, it's it's very clear the difference between. Gang stuff and graffiti stuff in LA is very clear now. Okay. Uh, but I think that um, LA has just been, you know, LA was one of the first cities outside of New York that really fucking started killing shit and yeah. became a, a culture. And, you know, they got on top of it. Just like New York got on top of the trains. They, got they already a, had the forecast of what happened before. Yeah, they, they yeah. got on top of it. So they're just yeah. on top of it. And they, they, you know, the old guard doesn't want the new guard to come in. They don't want a bunch of kids doing murals. They try to hold them down. No, that's right. Um, but, but but just to kind of add a little more value to what you were saying about Windward having its, you know, like it's its own backyard, maybe what we're seeing here from you in this environment technically is taking ownership of what space you don't have publicly, yeah. making your own and having it yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's I believe in that. Like I said, building it will come. Like, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm like... 
I'm um, I'm paying attention. You know, I showed you the archive room, oh, and yeah. I have books that I've been in, and, and all these things that I, I've never archived stuff before. So now I'm archiving all that stuff. Mm. It's becoming important to me now because you know I, I didn't have kids before. I was in and out of jail. I was doing whatever I was doing. It never really mattered to me. Mm. It was like you know I needed was a backpack, backpack, mm. and I was on my way. And now it's important to archive all this stuff. And and I guess when you archive all this stuff, it's a little different. There's something to be said for living by the seat of your pants and just being able to fucking bail and putting roots into a place, you know, because mm. I never really put roots down. Mm. And once you put roots down, it's a lot different. The whole game changes, you know? Mm. Do you think, because um, people respond to authenticity. They respond to uh, realness and people, who, like you say, hip-hop, paying their dues. Um, do you think uh, a lot of what's been created here by yourself and everyone around you, for that matter, a big shout to the whole team, uh, do you think that is rooted in your legitimacy of having done what you've done? And would you change any of what you've done to get to where you are now? Um, no, I wouldn't change anything, man. I would, I would have definitely archived a little more stuff. Right. It'd be nice to have some of the, the classic photos from the freeways and classic, like, you know, even the beat-down photos from getting beat up by police. And what, like, just, it's just stuff that's like, you know, I'd like to have some of the past again, you know. Uh, but... No, I wouldn't do anything. Yeah, I would do anything different, actually. I, you know, I, actually, I, you know. You would? Yes, I would. I don't know what I would do, but mm. I, would, I wouldn't repeat a lot of mistakes I've repeated. I know that, you know. Okay. I probably wouldn't be shot or stabbed as many times. Like, that, that would not have happened. How many times have you been shot and stabbed? I've only been shot once. Okay. Stabbed twice, but I've been shot at multiple times. But, you know, looking back, I should have known better in, in 90% of those situations, and I would know better now. Dude, you've been shot at multiple times. I, I, you see, it's funny, but I think if you're from LA, I think, unfortunately to say that, that's not, I mean, that's kind of common, you know? Really? Like, I think every graffiti artist from my era in LA, I want to say, has been shot at. Really? I mean, you know, wow. just just think about this, like Belmont Tunnel, you know? Yeah. There's, that neighborhood intersects three or four gangs. Gangs, yes, Major right. gangs. Yeah. There's a big bridge that goes over there. Yeah. And there's a, a little tunnel down there, and there's a little Specs painting, and you know that dude's not from your neighborhood. Mm. So you just take a shotgun and shoot down there at them, you know, whatever. So I got shot at there multiple times. What? So, you know, but also, let's let's be real. Back then, it wasn't like some high-powered fucking rifle. It's some buckshot from a shotgun, so it's, it wasn't like life-threatening. It's scary as fuck. Where did you get shot? I got shot on the leg by um, by Pure, a good friend of mine. I love you, Pure. Rest in peace. Um, we, uh, we were in the same... We're in the same crew after, um, and I got shot over some graffiti beef, and it took us years to. Uh, we're, we were good when he passed, and I really miss him. He he became one of my best friends, and um, even though he shot you, yeah, rest in peace, pure, for yeah, real. yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. That took a lot of work. It took a a bunch of strippers and a bunch of cocaine and a limousine and a bunch of crewmates to hold us on each side of the limousine and get us in there and hit Vegas for a night and uh, long story short I like the long story it sounds good man <laughs> uh, you know we did the time and became uh, super tight and had some yeah. great times yeah is that what's that going? there's something very 80s about what you just said 90s about what you just said there the, the whole idea of like jumping in and tre- trekking off to Vegas just to make uh, make peace well now we're how often did that happen well, I own Third Row Clothing, so I was there for trade shows. Okay, of course. So yes. we had all these things. So, you know, in a limo, and they had, everyone had it pre-set up. So they're like, Pure's going to be over here, get risking over here. Everyone stay between them. We'll get on the road. We'll tell each other who they are. And, and then the men's will happen, and it's all good. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. Ah, oh, yeah, I, I, it must be quite hard and challenging to think that, oh, would I change anything? Yes, but what? I have no idea. That, yeah, I think there's some... There's some uh, uh, strength in saying that as well. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, my graffiti was uh, always very bright. I always used a lot of bright colors because I love that because I wanted to stand out from New York and do different kind of things. So we had the, I did a lot of the fluorescence and stuff like that that mm. no one really used in New York. Way ahead of its time, yes. I love that. But, you know, my artwork, my gallery stuff was always very dark, cement, steel, dark colors, and now it's very bright, like my mm. graffiti palette. And butterflies. I put a lot of butterflies on stuff. Yeah. And uh, people are like, that doesn't seem like risk. I'm like, well, it's risk, man, because I'm in a celebratory stage of life. And with my daughters, I, I, I couldn't dream. For, like, look at the, it's like 
paradise, palm yeah. trees and fucking a beautiful house and home and people and friends and mm. whatever. So a celebratory stage of life and those butterflies to me are like a new beginning and new, whatever. Mm. And also the yeah. butterflies to me, like I look at them and I don't see any kind of like, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Like I, I, they're, they're very punk rock or rock to me. You know, I love those butterflies. They look fiery and they're cool. And uh, I love them. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, age comes wisdom. I yeah. think uh, um, a level of uh, level head maturity and understanding about the, the meaning and mortality of life. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and butterflies are symbolic to a change and a. And you know, growth. I have you know, uh, some friends of mine. You know, I, I did a lot of time in Venice Beach, and the whole punk rock thing and suicidal tendency, all those things that we grew up. Tendencies. Yeah, all those things we grew up around. Yeah. Uh, that whole anarch kind of mentality people always say from anarch to monarch and mm-hmm. monarch butterflies so oh. i was like oh man perfect you yeah know? that's beautiful damn see yeah. there's a meaning to everything you think through a lot of stuff you you really go deep into the meanings and and whys of now that i do i do i do i i mean i do to the to the point where it drives people crazy because i'll have some stuff that i do and i just won't do it because there's no meaning to it but everything I do has a meaning, mm-hmm. and I really believe wholeheartedly with art that it has to have a deep meaning. And I know a lot of people hate that. I'm like, fuck that. I do it just because I like doing it. I like it because it looks good. Cool, but maybe you should look into it a little more because you probably do have a meaning you don't know. Like, mm-hmm. I had a meaning I didn't know about the color field paintings. But, yeah, I really believe that it has to have meaning, it has to have roots, it has to have heritage. And I believe that's continuing dialogue with people before me because what I'm attracted to is what I've seen or it's resonated with me with someone before me. Mm-hmm. And my whole dialogue with my art is the Ferris Gallery before me in the mm-hmm. 60s, all those guys. Big up. So, on. yeah. One thing uh, I think Lars Ulrich said, uh, um, some kind of monster documentary, I'm sure you're aware of that documentary. He said, yeah, I think he had a lot of Basquiat's that he was selling, and, the, and one thing he said was like, you know, when does art stop being art? When, you know, when they make a decision to do that line, you know, someone yeah. else's interpretation of it later on is something else, and that's art as well. You know, I mean, yeah, it yeah. just always goes on forever, the whole yeah. theories of art and why. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? Good stuff. So the future, uh, by the looks of things, is healthy, full of pain, uh, full of uh, builds, and uh, full of rock and roll. Uh, it, what are, are we to expect that we aren't seeing in the physical right now? Uh, future, man. See, uh, I never know what the, people always say. What's next? I'm like, I think life is a hell of a ride. So like, I don't want to really know what's next because I think the ride's over. So I just kind of go with That's it. Yeah. yeah. So I just like the next best thing is cool. That's what I'm doing. As far as stuff I'm working on right now, I'm working on a new book. Uh, got a toy being released with Sideshow. They're gonna be here in a minute. You might get to see the toy. Fantastic. Uh, Sideshow collectibles. Um, I got a show. I'm getting a Lifetime Achievement Award in Miami in February. Congratulations. And that's really cool because <laughs> a lot of people that got it before me are dead. <laughs> I guess it's rare. It's rare to get it when you're alive. <laughs> yeah, don't hold your breath. Like he's so saying Herring, he's not going anywhere, Warhol, people. Bosk, yeah, like, all yeah. these people are dead. Yeah. And uh, Tony Goldman. And uh, I'm getting it while I'm alive, so that's good. Congratulations. Yeah, flowers. Wear flowers due at the right time as well. Yeah. So that's cool. So I'm doing that. And then I have uh, a couple art shows at the gallery we're doing. Um, what else? A lot of shit. A lot of shit. Yeah. All to look forward to, people. So, with that being said, thank you so much for having us, Risk. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. My we're pleasure. We're going to show us around the area. And, yes. Uh, yeah, we're going to uh, take a chill and uh, let you guys digest what's just been listened to. Killer Keller Podcast, out like was out of fashion. All right, tell a friend to tell a friend. Remember, crime don't pay, but neither did they. All right? <laughs> yeah, don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't. You stay lucky now, people. Nice on Risk. Right on. Peace. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was...